Zytrate comes in a little glass vial. A little glass vial! When you go out on the road, basically you're meeting like-minded people. It comes from a, a love of rock music and sort of the horror genre. And, and a hot chicks. <laughs> yeah. I'm here with the legendary Terrence Zadunich. How the heck you doing, man? I'm well. I'm legendary, apparently. You're pretty damn legendary, dude. People that think and like some of the same things you do. I know for a fact that the women just absolutely love you. <laughs> Um, a little jealous. And sure, some of them, maybe they want to fuck the devil. Who do lost and highly sheltered young girls turn to? A little glass vial. A little glass vial. A little glass vial goes into the gun like a battery. And yes, there is a, you know, our fan base is, I think, probably 70% young women. So, as a, as, a, as, a, as a male, as a male mammal, you know, it, it's very awesome. How the ladies treat you? Uh, the ladies have treated me really well. I mean, I, I wish I had to tell you I had a salacious tale to share. Um, you know, I was going to do something like in this vein, but I'm going to fuck you up and just do like a romantic And when these girls, well, you know, on one level, they didn't pay attention to me when I was in school. Now, yeah. like my art, like my music. Ray Robert does seem to be popular with the young ladies, so uh, I don't know what I did. I don't think I could even repeat it, but... You know, I could pretend I'm a rock star for a couple months out of the year. The love of this pop. Zydrate comes in a little glass vial. Repo the Genetic Opera is a 2008 film directed by Darren Lynn Bowsman and written and featuring music by Darren Smith and Terence Zadunich. The story started its life as The Necro Merchant's Debt, a two-person, ten-minute opera which Smith and Zadunich would perform at rock venues. The two went on to adapt the piece into a one-act show with a full cast, performed at various clubs in Los Angeles, and eventually a full-length play that peaked with an off-off-Broadway run. Along the way, the production picked up Bowsman, who would go on to direct several movies in the Saw franchise and garner enough clout to finance a short film based on the stage show as a way to pitch a feature to Lionsgate, who took the bait and funded the film. The result is a 90-minute fever dream starring Zadunich alongside the likes of Anthony Stewart Head, Alexa Vega, Paul Sorvino, Paris Hilton, Sarah Brightman, and for about 30 seconds, Joan Jett. The film was given a limited theatrical run in November of 2008, followed by a DVD release just two months later in January of 2009. Unhappy with this promotional effort by Lionsgate, the creative team took matters into their own hands with a roadshow tour of seven U.S. cities featuring screenings of the film and extensive Q&As with the cast and crew. Between the film's increased availability from the DVD release and significant word-of-mouth and message board buzz created by the tour, the film was well on its way to cult status by mid-2009, with one-off screenings popping up all around the country, often at midnight, often with audiences in cosplay, and often with full Rocky Horror-style shadow casts. And tracing this phenomenon backwards through its internet footprint, the figurehead of this whole production and its cult following very quickly seems to have distilled itself down to Terence Zadunich specifically. A cult of personality surrounding a man who built his artistic identity around being too weird for metal clubs, much less movie studios? Yep. Greenlight the shit out of that, not a red flag in sight. I myself am admittedly late to this party. I was aware of Repo as far back as late 2009-ish, but I only saw it the whole way through for the first time earlier this year when Musical Splaining covered it on a Tuesday morning when I had nothing better to do and was feeling a bit, well, not, not self-destructive. And friends, I don't know what happened. I basically dropped into a coma and woke up a week later having Zydrate gunned to Terence Zadunich's entire film and music career directly into my veins. Did I like it? Was I hate watching it? Am I a thirsty hoe full of self-loathing? I don't know! But I am going to fucking explode if I don't talk to someone about it, and my journal is not cutting it, so you're gonna listen and you're gonna like it. If you're here from the aforementioned cult following, hi, welcome. I hope you'll stick around and join me on the absolute brain breaker that was discovering your thing in the year 2021. I may not be one of you, but I continue to suspect that you are my people on some level, and I genuinely hope this is illuminating for you. If you're unfamiliar with this movie, uh, don't click away. I'm sure it's available on one free with ads streaming service or another, probably all of them, but don't go watch it. At least, not yet. 
stay with me. I am here to guide you gently into the void like I wish someone had done for me. This rabbit hole goes quite, quite far down, and it's dangerous to go alone. Take my hand and allow me to be your rock opera trip sitter. So we have covered who, when, and how is Repo. We will attempt to reckon with why is Repo, but first we must ask, very simply, what is Repo? It's the future. A mysterious epidemic is causing organ failure on a massive scale, and people can't pay for the operations they need, so in comes definitely evil megacorporation Gene Co. They'll set you up with a transplant on a payment plan, meaning the organs remain their legal property until fully paid off, and just like anything else bought on credit, they're liable for repossession. But since these are vital organs we're talking about, uh, you know, collateral damage. Enter Nathan, one of Gene Co.'s brutal repo men who, during the day poses as a plain old respectable doctor and father. He is haunted by guilt after his wife Marnie's death, which he believes he caused by botching her treatment for a rare blood disease. Now it's just him and his daughter Shiloh who has inherited her mother's illness, and he's determined not to repeat his mistakes, so he keeps her inside at all times and puts her on a heavy regimen of medication. But she's an angsty teen with dreams, so obviously she sneaks out whenever she can. Also at play here is the management of Gene Co. Roddy Largo and his three kids, Luigi, Pavi, and Amber. Luigi is a slut who's quick to apocalyptic fits of rage, Pavi is a degenerate who wears women's faces, and Amber is a spoiled brat with comorbid addictions to surgery and downers. Obviously they all suck, so Largo needs to figure out something else to do for the future of his company, and he needs to figure it out fast because he just received a terminal diagnosis, and it seems like he just might be scoping out Shiloh. Hmm, why would he do that? Well, Marnie, Shiloh's late mother, was engaged to Largo before she met Nathan, and Largo still carries a torch. He also, um, killed her by poisoning her medicine, framing Nathan, and using his guilt to blackmail him into working for Gene Co. indefinitely. You with me so far? Largo kidnaps Shiloh and brings her to a Gene Co. carnival, promising that he has the cure for her disease. Here we get a closer look at Mag, an opera singer whom Shiloh has been admiring through the television and who works as Gene Co.'s spokeswoman as payment for the cyberpunk eyes that allow her to see despite being born blind, and whose retirement concert is coming up soon. Just when we see a spark of recognition in those surgically enhanced corneas, Shiloh gets whisked away and stuffed in a tent where Gene Co. is presumably about to do some sort of surgery on her, but Grave Robber, who we've seen before both as the movie's narrator and as this weird creepy dude sneaking around harvesting some blue shit from the brains of corpses, helps her escape to his mysterious underground world world and tells her all about Zydrate, an addictive anesthetic used to prep patients for surgery that comes in a little glass vial. When who should show up looking for a fix but Miss Amber Sweet Nay Largo, who presumably in a drugged out stupor lets us in on the fact that she's super jealous of Mag's spotlight and is high key planning to have her eyes repoed so that she'll be the star. And this is all legal because Mag's announcement of her retirement has put her in breach of contract. Largo assigns Nathan to Mag's case, but the fact that she was a friend of Marnie's has Nathan sweating through his guilt even more than usual, so he refuses, leaving Largo swearing vengeance. Meanwhile, Mag shows up at Shiloh's house and uses her cyberpunk eyes to show off some video footage of Marnie, revealing that she was supposed to be Shiloh's godmother, but Nathan lied and told her she didn't survive birth. Mag tells Shiloh that her mom would have wanted her to get out there and live, but before they can get any further than that, Nathan comes home and everyone's mad at everyone. Largo decides to officially will Jean Co. to Shiloh and make a public announcement at the opera. He promises Shiloh he'll have her cure if she kills the repo man at the opera. Amber's singing at the opera, Mag's singing at the opera, Luigi and Pavi are watching the opera, Nathan's going on a murder spree at the opera, everyone's going to the opera. Amber's face falls off, it's very embarrassing. Mag slaps a big finale on her performance by clawing out her own eyes rather than keep working for Gene Co. forever, and Largo kills her for 
it. Nathan rolls up in full brutal repo mode, and Shiloh bonks him with a shovel only to discover her dad's horrific secret identity. She is pissed off and confused. Largo has Nathan tied up and reveals to Shiloh and the crowd that not only is Nathan the scary, scary repo man, he has been lying to Shiloh about her disease this whole time, and her medicine is actually microdosed poison because Nathan is too afraid of losing her to let her leave the house ever. Nathan cops to everything, and Largo tells Shiloh that she can have all of Jean Co. if she just kills her father. Shiloh refuses and threatens to kill Largo instead, but Nathan encourages her to correct for his genes and not follow in his murderous footsteps. Largo, taking matters into his own hands for once, shoots Nathan and promptly drops dead. Nathan and Shiloh decide that since it's his deathbed and all, they can just not address the whole Munchausen by proxy thing, and they cry a bunch. Shiloh refuses to take over the mega corporation and drives away in a limo. Amber inherits everything, and Jean Co. continues to reign supreme into the dark future. All of the above takes place in 98 minutes minus credits, and it's a rock opera. So this is just, it's a movie that's incredibly tempting to script Doctor. I want to say it has good bones, but it's not your classic problem of having good bones fleshed out by heaps and heaps of fluff. It's more like it's got enough loose bones banging around in a bag to form six human skeletons, but nobody ever went through to label which ones went with which. You've got a pretty clever horror premise and a series of theoretically compelling sociological ideas, and a whole host of characters with bits and pieces of interesting arcs, all adding up to something that is just begging for the editorial vision of someone who hadn't been living with this thing for six years to make some decisions about which central ideas need fleshing out and which darlings need killing. Nathan's grief and guilt channeled into ruining his daughter's life for her own good has some really interesting horror anti-hero potential. But it's nigh impossible to do it justice if it's treated as a twist, and it's not really clear how, if at all, that arc feeds into the Repo Man situation. Shiloh's need to forge her own path in the face of what she erroneously believes are doomed genes is a goldmine of a thematic tie-in to a world where elective organ transplants are on vogue, but is only tenuously related to her title character dad, and is tough to resolve using the plot device of should I run the murder corporation or not, resulting in the gigantic yike that is this movie's conclusion, where the only way Shiloh can believe she won't be a murderer like her dad is finding out she's actually not sick like her mom? Jeez. And a mega corporation killing an underclass for needing healthcare they can't afford when the anesthetic that keeps the rich comfortable for their glamour liver transplants is harvested from the corpses of the poor is the kind of idea that a good writer would kiss themselves for coming up with, especially in retrospect from the 2020s. Fuck, man. But that pipeline is established in a way that doesn't make anywhere near that level of metaphorical or even literal sense. Zydrate comes in a little glass vial. Zydrate doesn't even come in a little glass vial. It comes in the brains of corpses and literally one guy harvests and distributes it and he does both via needle gun. There is no shipping and handling. There is no middleman. Why is this his musical's only fucking hook? Okay, yeah, we're gonna talk about Zydrate because I think it's pretty emblematic of some of the story problems that plague the movie as a whole. So Zydrate is, I mean, it's opioids, basically. It's a drug that is legal in some form as marketed by Geneco, but for which there is also an illegal underground market. But it's not really clear what the difference between the two drugs is, or even the function of the drug versus vanity surgery itself. If this were a straightforward opioid allegory, you'd want to make it clear that people were getting hooked on Zydrate after having had it administered by a doctor, and we're continuing to seek out that high by less and less regulated and more and more dangerous means, long after it was a medically necessary treatment. Or maybe you'd want to touch on access to Zydrate being one of the motivations behind all of the elective organ transplants that have left so much of the populace in mountains of debt and constant fear of the repo man. But in this world, it seems to go the other direction. Even grave robbers' clientele are seeking out illegal Zydrate in order to get more surgery, which is portrayed as being itself addictive. I had my first surgery when I was 13. 
And thanks to Z, I couldn't feel or remember a thing. When the gun goes off, it sparks and you're ready for surgery. Amber Sweet is addicted to the knife. Like, what's going on here? Are these people getting high on their own before they get put under by the doctors? Does Jinko default to operating while the patient is fully conscious and sober? Is there illicit street surgery to go with the illicit street drugs? This is the kind of stuff that could almost fly under the radar in an otherwise coherent plot if it weren't for Amber. Amber Sweet is addicted to the knife. Addicted to the knife? Addicted to the knife. But she's also the heiress of the mega corporation that started this opera shit. She runs everything, including everyone's surgeries and the legal Zydrate market. Why would she need to get her drugs from sketchy and illegal sources? Luigi just fucking stabs employees for looking at him funny on more than one occasion. Amber orders a hit on Mag because she wants the spotlight. The whole business is built on framing a guy for murder in order to make that guy murder whoever Largo wants to murder. I need something as to why this company's ethics are so stringent when it comes to the locks on their pharmacy cabinets, you know? I swear, I'm not trying to be cinema sins here. Like, it's sure, there are plenty of little ding-worthy inconsistencies to harp on, if that's your thing. Shiloh is really inconsistent in her worry about being outside, and even less so in her gas mask usage when she does. Why does she pass out from not taking her medicine if the medicine is actually bad for her? Amber and Pavi both get face transplants, but Pavi looks like this and Amber looks like this. Having one's eyes clawed out is violent and medically unsafe, but unlikely to be the death sentence everyone acts like repoing Mag would be. Whatever. This is incredibly uninteresting to me. What's interesting is this movie's ostensible belief that it has something socially prescient to say through the Zydrate market, through surgery addiction, through having Amber and Grave Robber have a relationship at all coupled with a distinct lack of effort to distill the details into something remotely intelligible. This all comes to a head in the sequence where Amber tries very aggressively to convince Grave Robber to let her settle her drug debts with sex. Literally, why? She has all of the money. All of it. And even if daddy cut her off just off screen or whatever, her family has law enforcement in their pocket and Grave Robber is a criminal. He has zero power in this situation. Situation. Amber does not need to convince him of shit. Was this supposed to be the beginning of an actual romantic arc for these two that got dropped at some point? Does Zydrate just make people horny as a side effect? Did nobody think about this longer than drugs are edgy and sex is edgy? Why don't we just throw them both at our movies so people know that we're edgy? Or did this come up at some point in pre-production and Terrence Sedunich was just like, I don't care, we're keeping it because I'm in charge and I'm not passing up the opportunity to dry hump Paris Hilton. I mean, he talks about this at like every fucking Q&A he ever does. Try my new parts. I know it's a fan favorite. I get lots of very interesting comments. And <laughs> It was certainly a fun thing to shoot, and I think it's a cool scene. Any chance to have any kind of real flow or chemistry? If it ever was a possibility when you're making out with Paris Hilton. <laughs> all the cameras around you. It, it ain't gonna happen. You know, a year ago I was broke as an artist. You know, just trying to get anyone to listen to my material. And then suddenly it's like, okay, you get to bang her something on us. You know, uh, whatever, I'm probably being too harsh here. The scene didn't actually make it into the final movie outside of some recycled footage in a montage, so it's left just implied that there's some sexual dynamic between the two of them. I'm sure that's because they realized exactly what I'm saying and made the right judgment call in post. It's not Terrence Zadunich's fault that people who host Shadowcast screenings like to include a deleted scene and act like children about it, and I'm probably being supremely unfair by referencing what is effectively a bonus feature in my critique of this film, and I'm sure it'll never come up again. What we are left with is Zydrate Anatomy, a prime example of maybe the most interesting problem that plagues this movie, which is that the best songs, like as songs, are also consistently representative of the most fundamental plot issues. At the right party, if you can get the room's attention for long enough to go, Zydrate comes in a little glass vial. A little glass vial? There goes your whole evening, but it's also the center of this whole confusion where the movie can't decide what it's doing with its metaphor. Chase the Morning is another fan favorite with a decent sample style hook and some solid performances. <laughs> but it can't seem to decide whether it thinks Jane Co. is a dangerous and scary megacorporation of which Shiloh should steer clear. It's too late for me. Don't look back till you 
Street. Or a super cool tech startup that gave Mag superpowers. These eyes can do more than see. I know, I mean, I've seen you sing. And is left with very little time to consider the actual character relationship it's supposed to be exploring. Night Surgeon is a solid rock opera track, probably the closest thing we get to a functional aria where a character really gets to go through something emotionally via a serviceable piece of music. but is emblematic of the problem with Nathan's arc, where the most compelling guilt and turmoil he should be processing is that he has been poisoning his daughter on purpose for years. But we need to preserve that for the big twist in the finale, and all this hand-wringing about accidentally killing his wife and then getting blackmailed into killing a lot of other people after that feels kind of cheap once you know that he's the bad guy not only by circumstance, but also by choice. But ultimately this comes down to what I would call the film's most critical weakness, which is that its plot is not only rather more busy than it has figured out how to make followable on a first watch, but conveyed through music that is not pulling its weight as a storytelling tool. The libretto leans pretty heavily on a style that if you manage to squeeze one history of European music course into your university schedule, you could call recitativo accompagnato or recitativo strumentato. Who's gonna sing then after you leave? Have a please, it's not my place. Let me explain clumsily. So basically, in European opera, the rule is that the characters can't speak, they can only sing. The musical meat of opera comes from a style called aria, which is more or less what you'd think of as a song, and the part of opera that has transferred into musical theater. <laughs> The primary job of an aria is to sound pretty. The character is usually singing about their feelings, the lyrics usually need to be pretty repetitive so they can serve the form of the song. These are the parts you walk away humming at the end of the night. But it's pretty tough to fit an entire plot where stuff like happens into that kind of music, so you also get recitative, where you can dump a lot of words and not worry quite so much about whether it's a toe tapper as long as it's technically music. There's two kinds, recitativo secco, or dry recitative, which is accompanied pretty much only by sustained chords, so the singer can be very loose about the rhythm and basically just speak, but like on a series of notes. <laughs> And then there's recitativo accompagnato or strumentato, or accompanied or measured recitative, which basically means there is a melody and there is a set rhythm and it is accompanied by instruments like a song, but its primary job isn't to be pretty as much as it's to communicate plot information and smooth the transition into full aria. Zadunich's third favorite talking point about Repo after it's weird but in like a rocky horror way, and did he mention he kissed Paris Hilton, is that it isn't a musical, it's an opera, because everything is sung. Repo is different and it, it's not a musical, it's an opera, which means it's sung from beginning to end. There's no spoken dialogue. So the emphasis on recitative makes a lot of sense from a compositional standpoint. 98 minutes is a lot of music to write, and this movie has a lot of plot to get out there in that time. It also makes a certain amount of aesthetic sense, because Repo uses opera not only as a format, but as a feature of its world, and recitative can be a very useful shorthand to evoke the idea of European opera for a modern-day audience. One could, if one were so inclined, point out that recitative tends to be a big factor in a lot of modern listeners bouncing off of historical European opera, and it isn't really doing this movie any particular favors in the pure listenability department. Bye. Let me go. But you know, listenability isn't the only factor in what makes music an effective storytelling tool. You're not gonna hear otherwise from me. I have been kicked out of lunch tables for fucking with Sondheim too enthusiastically. Most honorable Judge Turpin. Most honorable. Uh. 
But while the music doesn't have to be pretty, it does need to do something. And in this movie, it is generally hurting far more than it is helping. Some of this is pretty straightforwardly bad ideas, like having characters overlap one another with completely different sets of information. There's also just, uh, maybe this is just me or some weird compression that can be blamed on whatever cheap platform I originally watched this movie on because I haven't heard too many other complaints about it, but something in the mix feels really off to me. I feel like half the time I can barely even hear the words that are being sung. Engineering isn't something I know a lot about though, so it's entirely possible I'm misplacing the blame for the larger problem, which is that these songs are pretty confusing in their own right and kind of require you to go at them with a brush like you're on an archaeological dig to really figure out what's going on. And while some of that is the amount of information being communicated, a lot of it is the composition itself. There's something just a little bit off most of the time that puts the emphasis just on the wrong syllable. Now, I don't mean the emphasis is literally on the wrong syllable. It sometimes is, but that isn't necessarily a problem. Lyrics are a pretty complex form of writing that open up some really cool expressive potential when composed deliberately and confidently, in part because your audience's ears will accept things that wouldn't sound quite right in normal speech if they are supported by the music. So, for example, the title drop in Friend of the Show, Pink Floyd's Another Brick in the Wall Part 2. All in all, you're just a another brick in the wall. I don't care how British you are, that's not how you pronounce that word. If you were going to say that out loud, if this were a line of spoken dialogue, that's about the most stilted and confusing way you could deliver it. But combined with the music, it is very expressively effective. This is a song about a rigid and oppressive school system, and within the context of the wall as a whole, the lasting damage done to the adults it produces. This line directly follows a moment of rebellion where the melody pops out of the repetitive drone where it's been sitting and stands up to be counted. Hey, teacher, leave them kids alone. Following this up with that big, carefully placed pause that would be so awkward in normal speech allows the listener to fill in how the singer is going to finish the sentence and keep fighting back. All in all, you're just a f of a man and you can go f yourself. But it doesn't go that way. It's a concession. Ultimately, the singer lacks the power to meaningfully push back against the system, and the only effective dig he'll be able to follow through on is like, well, my therapist and I are gonna have words about you someday, believe you me. Or at least that's what it does for me. I don't know what was going through Roger Waters' head when he wrote that line, and there certainly are plenty of other ways you could interpret that pause. But because it takes place in a song that is so clearly carefully constructed as a piece of a larger whole with a lot of meaning to convey, and yes, slaps, I am within my legal rights to call you an incurious party pooper if your primary takeaway is that that's a weird way to pronounce the word another. That's not to say that the way words are pronounced in speech never matters. If the lyrics and the music aren't supporting one another in some way, it's gonna sound like hot garbage. If I were feeling extremely petty, which I think we've established I usually am, I could point out that it is very obvious from Doug Walker's parody of Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 for Nostalgia Critics The Wall and Anthony Fantano's parody of Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 slash Doug Walker diss track that exactly one of the two of them understands how the original song works on a mechanical level. All in all, it's just not good. It's not good. So as a sort of case study of what I mean in the context of Repo, let's look at this one line from 21st Century Cure. And it's my job to steal and rob. <laughs> And by way of comparison, let's look at a similar moment in the Uber meme, Drowning Pools, Bodies. Let the bodies hit the... Now, to be clear, I'm not saying these two lines are the same or that 21st Century Cure is plagiarized. That argument wouldn't hold up in copyright court. 
or at least it shouldn't. No one knows what it's like to feel these feelings. But these two musical moments are similar enough that the differences between them illuminate a lot about the relative levels of success at what they're trying to do. So the phrase, let the bodies hit the floor, if you were gonna just say it out loud, you probably wouldn't hit the word floor nearly as disproportionately hard as Dave Williams does here. As far as operative words, bodies, hit, and floor are all about equal, so you'd probably hit all three of them about equally. Let the bodies hit the floor. Let the bodies hit the floor. Let the bodies hit the floor. God, this is so difficult. The song is in my head. I'm just in full Meisner mode here. The emphasis is literally on a weird syllable to a degree that makes another brick in the wall part two look downright cute. But again, musically, there's a lot more going on here. First off, the sentence, let the bodies hit the floor, while quite evocative, is not particularly complex. We don't really need much assistance from the music to understand the literal words words being said. Second, it's repeated four times in a row in this introduction alone. This means that even before the song proper has begun, we get it, and the words take on a role that is as much percussive as it is literally meaningful. But segueing into the rest of the song with that scream does more than just not work. It's performing a couple of distinct functions. The rhythmic whispering is entirely unaccompanied, so while you can feel a very clear pulse in the introduction, it's not totally clear where the down beat is. A uh, quick term definition, the downbeat is where you'd count the number one in a measure, so basically during this introductory section you can feel ba 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 very clearly, but if you're going to count one, two, three, four, it's not obvious yet which ba goes with which number. If you're just listening to a song, you don't necessarily need to know where the downbeat is. Check out some experimental jazz or ask music theory Twitter about Ludacris's rollout. But if you want to play a song with a band or dance to a song with other people or maybe mosh, it's a good idea to get everyone on the same page. To my ear, it sounds like let the is a pickup and the downbeat hits on the first syllable of bodies, but without any additional context, you wouldn't be wrong to place it anywhere else. But then the vocals drop out for two beats while the cymbal counts off, and then that scream comes smashing through, and I struggle to think of a clearer way to drop a downbeat. We are now all in agreement, and we can get to flailing without confusion. But this isn't purely technical, it's also the music embodying the idea of the song. The bodies hitting the floor in this context are concert goers in a mosh pit, and the song both describes and mirrors the buildup of struggle and tension and aggression of feeling out of place and stressed out by life that finds a release in listening to some loud-ass live music and consensually throwing the whole weight of one sweaty body at a bunch of strangers' sweaty bodies. The whisper, the pause, the cymbal, and the scream create a build-up and release of tension that is as much a musical embodiment of life is hard and we must thrash as it is a technical rhythmic orientation. And just as a complete aside, most of my musical training comes from choral and concert band settings, so the way I to it rhythm is very connected to this gesture, and writing this section involved a lot of listening to thrash metal and conducting under my desk, and anyway, I have an alter ego now. Let the bodies hit the floor, let the bodies hit the floor, let the bodies hit the floor, let the bodies hit the Okay, but you know, obviously writing a song about the liberating power of moshing that's also super fun to mosh to is a lot less of a tall order than a character introduction in a pretty complex rock opera. <laughs> It's my job to steal and rob graves once again contains multitudes without being too literally complex. As an idea, it is evocative, but not too difficult to wrap one's head around. But as a sentence, as a set of words, it presents some challenges. So a quick grammar detour, that kind of video, one way to categorize verbs in the English language is as transitive versus intransitive. A transitive verb has a direct subject 
object with it. So like love in the sentence, I love dogs. An intransitive verb doesn't act on a direct subject, so like the word run in the sentence, I run with my dog. A lot of verbs can function either as transitive or intransitive depending on the context. So for example, we just looked at an intransitive use of run, but I could also say I ran a marathon. I mean, I couldn't, but for someone who had, that would be a transitive use. So back to grave robbing, both steal and rob can function either as transitive or intransitive verbs. In their intransitive uses, they have very similar meanings. If you were writing a 10th grade paper where you used the word rob too many times, you might find steal as an alternative in a thesaurus, and as long as you were replacing it in an intransitive context, you'd probably be fine. But in their transitive uses, things get a little gooey. So if I say that someone robbed a bank, that, it, you know, it was probably pretty scary for most of the people involved, but you get it. It's not an idea that's too far outside the realm of possibility. But if I say that someone stole a bank, I am either sharing a universe with Carmen San Diego or making careless use of a thesaurus. Got it? So if I then say that someone both stole and robbed a bank, I mean, what? Why? It kind of seems like once the entire bank was in their possession, they'd be covered, right? And this is why this is such a clunky sentence. Grammatically speaking, it is unclear whether it is grave robber's job both to steal graves and to rob graves, or to steal and, separately, to rob graves. Now, in most cases, I'd happily categorize this as one of those times where grammar policing is obnoxious and basically pointless. The idea of stealing graves is so strange on its face, I don't even know what that would physically mean, that we're gonna understand that it's my job to steal and rob graves. But in the realm of lyrics, this is the kind of thing you'd want to keep in mind while working on the music. And this song is exactly what not to do. The musical phrase here has a couple of significant pauses. And it's my job to steal and rob. By grouping steal and rob together and setting them in a way that leads up to graves, the music emphasizes that grammatical ambiguity. Which again, I don't think most people who hear this are gonna have a hard time understanding the literal meaning. I doubt that anybody is watching this movie and getting hung up on like, wow, how would you even steal a whole grave? But the music and the literal meaning of the words are fighting one another in a way that rather than adding the kind of additional layer of meaning that we saw in Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 obscures what meaning is already literally there. So you have to take a moment to be like, wait, what? Ah, uh-huh, got it. And unlike what we saw in Bodies, this isn't a well-established phrase that takes on meaning inherently through repetition, or even a well-established idea. This is Grave Robber's introduction. Up until this point, he's served as a pretty-looking, fourth-wall-breaking narrator. His job, and even his existence in the diegesis of the film, is new information. You're real? But who he is and what he does are not actually the main lyrical focus here. The primary ideas expressed in this song and its accompanying scene, approximately in order, are 1. The world is fucked 2. Zydrate is a legal drug sold by Geneco 3. Organ leasing is a thing 4. Zydrate is also an illegal drug sold on underground markets 5. Lots of people are dead because they leased organs they couldn't afford 6. This blue stuff grave robber is getting from corpses is in some way connected to this whole organ leasing slash dead people situation 7. Grave robbing is super illegal 8. It's grave robber's job to steal and rob graves 9. Some organ transplants are a voluntary luxury thing and 10. Shiloh is very stressed about being here. Okay, so that is a lot of information, and there are a few issues here. Those of you familiar with Repo may notice that all of those points directly related to the current state of the world and the organ market are covered in the opening number. I don't even mean the prologue with the comic book panels where you have to read pretty fast to keep up, although they are covered there as well. I mean, we have heard Grave Robber sing them to us, more or less in as many words, accompanied by a pretty striking visual sequence not seven minutes ago. This is a major character's I Am song, and he spends half 
half of it explaining stuff we already know about the world. The new information about Zydrate, the whole reason why Grave Robber's job is to steal and rob graves, is not even really part of his song. It comes from a voice on a loudspeaker interspersed with what Grave Robber is singing, so you have to keep track of both alternating trains of thought at the same time, and one of them is passed through an audio filter that deliberately makes it a little tough to understand. And you may also notice that there are a couple of really important pieces of information we don't explicitly get. That this blue stuff grave robber is robbing from the graves is Zydrate is left to inference, and even though that is briefly covered in the comic book intro, it goes by so quickly in the middle of a giant exposition dump, and there's so much other stuff happening by now that you would very much be forgiven for not making that leap. It's also pretty unclear what Zydrate is, or how it is connected to organ leasing. If you caught that this blue stuff is Zydrate, you've probably figured out that it's harvested from the corpses of people who died by repossession, but not that it is an anesthetic used to prep transplant patients for surgery. That's not the worst thing if it's deliberately being held to be revealed later, but it does make it at least a hair confusing why Grave Robber is hawking elective surgery to Shiloh through the whole second verse, other than he's a also kind of All of this is to say, there are a lot of balls in the air here, and if the audience is meant to have any hope of following all of this, the music needs to be helping us out. Which brings us back to... <laughs> In the scene happening on camera, as soon as Grave Robber lets that out, all of the law enforcement flashlights we've seen in the background suddenly land on him, and it becomes a merry chase scene. This character is diegetically yelling. So on top of the fact that it's a confusing phrase in the way the music and the lyrics fight one another over maybe the most important piece of information straightforwardly included in the song, there is yet one more thing being conveyed here, which is that this character is choosing to attract the attention of of the police while doing something extremely illegal. So above and beyond, for the love of all that is holy, this is so much for a first time viewer to absorb all at once. For what purpose? Why would he do that? If you're expecting it to go anywhere, it doesn't. He is a puckish rogue, but he is also extremely savvy and sneaky for the rest of the movie. Nothing about this musical choice is doing anybody any favors except making opera edgy. <laughs> Okay. That took a very long time, so you are just going to have to trust me that this is not a one-off situation in an otherwise functional song through rock musical. This is precisely the kind of musical, lyrical, and filmmaking choice upon which Repo the Genetic Opera is built, and it is extremely confusing and downright exhausting to watch. So naturally, after finishing it, I immediately sought out Zadunich and Bausman's further collaborative work. The Devil's Carnival is a 2012 film directed by Darren Lynn Bousman, written, starring, and featuring music by Terence Zadunich with co-songwriter Sar Hendelman, and featuring a number of returning cast members from Repo alongside the likes of Dayton Callie, Sean Patrick Flannery, and Five Finger Death Punch's Ivan L. Moody. And this one instantly gets a few huge steps up from Repo in my book. First off, it was made on an actual micro-budget. Like, your average Blumhouse movie gets five to ten times this much money. Maybe that's a weird thing to list as a pro, but one thing that happens presumably as a result is that the production design is radically simplified, resulting in something that looks like a halfway decent black box stage show and is not trying to look like anything other than a black box stage show. Maybe this is a personal thing, but I found myself instantly willing to cut it a sizable amount of slack because it felt like going to see a play. You know, maybe one that a friend was in, and we'd go get a beer afterwards, and I'd tell them that they were great, and then change the subject. And blessedly, this this is not sung through, we have dialogue back, and I can basically understand what's literally happening at any given moment. Thank God. The plot itself is also not all that complicated in the first place. Again, thank God. Three sinners arrive in hell and are tested by carnival attractions targeted toward the sins that landed them here. That's it. Well, then at the very last second, Lucifer declares that hell is mounting an attack on heaven, but honestly, that's more of a mid credits sequel tease that just happens to be attached to the main plot. This movie was originally theorized as the pilot episode of a TV show, and if you treat it as such, you're gonna have a much better time. Okay, so 
our sinners. First and most straightforward is Ms. Marywood. She's greedy and vain, so hell sets her up with your classic midway toss game scam to try and win a giant diamond, and the demon running the thing can change its face to look just like her. It's a pretty women be shopping depth of understanding of both greed and vanity, and it's a little um, convenient that her punishment involves having all of her pretty clothes except for her pretty lacy underwear ripped off and then being very sexily whipped. And also this scene was done without a stunt coordinator, and you can really tell. Like, there are moments where Alexa Vega is waving her hand in one direction and Brianna Evagon is reacting in the other, and it looks like a stage combat class on day one. Like, I don't think it's actually supposed to read that she's slapping her, but they're stacked in a way where that's what it looks like. And TBH, the fact that nobody caught that does not make me feel great about where that whip is landing. Also, Alexa Vega broke her wrist on this set. Fuck's sake, hire a stunt coordinator, you goons. But you know, at the very least, I understand what's happening here on a conceptual level. Sin on Earth, don't learn the lesson, get tortured eternally. Got it. But with our other two, things go a bit off the rails. By far the most sympathetically framed character is John. His sin was allowing himself to be consumed by grief after the death of his son, to the point where he eventually died by suicide. For the record, that suicide is depicted in the movie twice, so big content warning if you watch it. John's challenge is that he has to wait his turn for his carnival attraction, no matter how urgent he wants to track down his son, who he's sure is here somewhere. He also gets sexually assaulted by every woman in the carnival at once and gets his ear bitten off at a kissing booth for reasons. Anyway, he obviously fails his test in a sequence that I am not going to show because, look, I've never had any problem at all with flashing lights, but there's such an aggressive strobe going on that I felt like I was gonna pass out. This shit makes the season one finale of Stranger Things look like broad daylight. If you're even a little bit photosensitive, this movie wants you to die. Instead of his son, John finds Lucifer, who tells him what a dip he was for being so sad all the time, and goads him on to wallow in his grief even more deeply now that his son's eternal soul is nowhere to be found. John is tempted, but finally stands up and says no, he will not grieve, and Lucifer lets him leave and go to heaven. Okay. Like, I get that suicide is generally considered a damnable sin by most of the doctrines that roll with hell being a place where sinners go. Uh, with the right framing, I could even buy that wallowing in one's own tragedy and pointedly refusing the loving kindness of fellow survivors forever and ever, amen, is a kind of choosing hell for oneself. The Great Divorce? is a banger. But our lone male sinner being eternally damned for being too sad and earning salvation by repressing his emotions merits a legal minimum of one large yike from me, friends. And then there's Tamara. Tamara. Tam Tamara. Tamara. I'm gonna say that wrong every time. Now before we go any further, let me say something nice. Tamara's downfall comes with the single best song The Devil's Carnival has to offer. The music in this movie, while still uh, far from toe-tapping for reasons that it definitely wants you to think are related to how smart it is, but very well may come down to garden variety incompetence at writing toe-tappers. You're my beautiful stranger, the game is a fu- Shadow's domain, so don't pussy for shoot. Is generally both a lot more interesting and a lot more listenable than that of Repo. Once upon a time, heaven was a tower, tower, feathered in its pride, and cast us grapes of sour, sour. Part of this is that the layer of confusion is a lot more forgivable since the songs don't have to do so much heavy lifting in the narrative, and part of it I feel comfortable crediting to Zadunich's new co-composer, Sar Handelman, with whom he has continued to work for the rest of the projects we'll discuss today. Tamara's damnation song, The Scorpion's Tale, in particular, is genuinely pretty melodically interesting, and it's given a downright virtuosic performance by goth rocker Emily Autumn as a demon carny named Painted Doll. Rick, Rick, Rick. The scorpion's and the movie's Aesop's Fables framing device is at its most clear here, which, you know, 
cool. Some of my best friends are Hot Topic trash. So if you're not familiar, The Scorpion and the Frog is a quick little ditty about a scorpion who needs to cross a river, and so he tries to enlist the help of a frog to give him a ride. The frog is skeptical because the scorpion could kill him, but the scorpion's like, hey, why would I sting you? If you die, I'll drown. So the frog's like, all right, that actually makes sense. You don't seem like you have any more of a death wish than anyone else, so I guess I can help you out. And then in the middle of the river, the scorpion stings the frog, and the frog is like, why? Now we're both gonna die. And the scorpion's like, sorry, bro, I can't help who I am. And the frog dies, and the scorpion drowns. So. If I were to, hypothetically, pitch you a movie where hell is a carnival and all the sinners are living out loose retellings of Aesop, where the morals of the story are their reasons for damnation, and one of them is the scorpion and the frog, I mean, it'd be pretty clear who the sinner is in that scenario, right? Come on. It's obvious. It's the frog. In the movie's opening sequence, where we meet our gallery of sinners at the moments of their deaths, Tamara is presumably shot and killed by the abusive boyfriend she is in the process of trying to leave. She wakes up in hell, where she is tested by a pretty-faced knife thrower who persuades her to help him escape from the cage he's been locked in and invites her to be his new lovely assistant, at which point he promptly throws a knife directly into her heart. Okay. Number one, she's already dead. That's how she got here. Since when does eternal damnation mean just dying a second time? Weak. Number two, holy shit, she was sent to hell for getting killed by her shitty boyfriend and confirmed that she deserved eternal damnation by getting killed by another shitty boyfriend. What in the, like, what in the hell? What in the literal hell? What am I supposed to do with that? I just, who oh got the, the hubs, but, Tamara also gets the number that was most heavily featured in the movie's promotion, and the one you can still buy merch for. This movie's Zydrate Anatomy. In all my dreams I drown, get it? Because the frog and the scorpion, they drowned, appears during the film's credit roll, though it was apparently originally part of the movie proper. I'm not sure where it would have gone or what it's really supposed to do from a narrative standpoint, except that Terence Dedunich you know, he wrote the thing, and he's playing the title character and all, but he didn't really end up with much of anything to actually do. So why shouldn't he lay claim to a gratuitous and exceptionally rapey duet with the pretty and innocent young lady whose damnable sin was that she can't stop banging men who want to hurt her? I don't know, I'm sure I'm just reading too deep into it. The sequel to The Devil's Carnival, called Alleluia, The Devil's Carnival, except in all the promotional material where it's called The Devil's Carnival, episode two, keeps the Aesop framing device, but also returns to form with an absolute disaster clusterfuck of a plot. Hell is preparing to mount its attack on heaven, Lucifer's been playing his music too loud and sending sinners back up the pipeline and it's pissing off God, and in the middle of all this plotting, Lucifer sits down and reads The Filly and the Lapdog, which is Aesop the ass and the lapdog, except she's a hot lady, so she's a filly, to a mysterious hooded figure. The fable follows a flashback to, uh, like, the early glory days of hell, but takes place primarily in heaven, following a batch of new applicants, including pre-damnation painted doll June and her definitely straight gal pal Cora, trying to earn their place in the old Hollywood studio system inspired Heavenly Productions Incorporated by currying the favor of folks like the librarian, the designer, meddling paparazzo the watchword, glamorous radio personalities, the publicist and his ladies of virtue, and our fabled lapdog, God's agent. Don't expect to understand what's happening in the present day battle, it makes no sense. Don't expect anyone in the flashback to act like a person, it's not gonna happen. Heaven is not so subtly coded as the Third Reich, and God as Hitler, which uh, I would argue is the kind of parallel that merits significantly more clarity of purpose and target than you'll find here. And there's some definite, if undefined, homophobia and or transphobia to the fact that all of the unimportant men of this evil masquerading as good business wear skirts and makeup, so, uh, you know, that sucks. But once you get past all that, there's some stuff to enjoy. If you thought these movies were rocking bizarrely stacked casts before, hold on to your butts. We're adding Adam Pascal, Barry Bostwick, David Hasselhoff, Lyndon Smith, Butcher Babies, Tech 9 and Jesus Christ himself, 
Ted Neely. Sheesh. There are some cute little low budget visual effects happening that I'll be honest, really work for me. They're fun. And the Aesop construct is actually, I think, kind of at its best here. It's not just there for like Tim Burton flavor. The movie has a point of view about it and that feels like a pretty major step up. The Ass and the Lapdog is basically a story about how if you were born a low class brute, you should accept your fate because you'll only embarrass yourself if you try to have nice things, which, you know, sucks. But the movie specifically takes this opportunity to point out that it sucks. We, uh, learn, maybe? I don't know, it's still kind of unclear, but it's implied that the reason these fables exist in this world is that God wrote them to teach people how to behave. And Lucifer is pushing back against that kind of hyper control in part by arguing that God's rules are kind of essentialist and totalitarian, and that sucks. You do kind of have to be familiar with the story of the ass and the lapdog to get that, though. The way the storybook is woven into the flashback never quite gets to the moral, and the levels of heaven that are indicated by numbers and animal roles are actually shown to be navigable. Like, Cora is presumably a number seven working horse when we meet her, the applicants are all fillies, but by the end of the movie she is a number two singing bird. So it's less essentialist totalitarianism and more a garden variety corrupt system, but if you squint at it, thematic coherence. That's neat, but also who cares? The music in this movie finally threatens to be good. For one thing, there's some really decent scoring stuff happening. Like when June first meets the agent, you hear a little echo of the scorpion's tail. My pleasure. It's a really effective cue because it works on two levels. Most obviously, this guy is June's scorpion of sorts. He is about to be trouble for her on the level where she's gonna end up sent to hell, which is a reminder of what gets women eternally damned in this universe, but hey, at least it's consistent. And even more interestingly, June is, or June will be, Painted Doll, who sang that song in the Devil's Carnival, or will sing that song? I don't know, flashback chronology. But it's a neat little hint at something that might function as a twist depending on how well you recognize her face. I like it. Now as far as the songs, there are some lower lows than we've seen so far on a technical level. Like there's a take that made it into Everybody's Doing the Arc where it's clear that someone forgot or didn't know the choreography. And there are times in The Bells of Black Sunday where the Ladies of Virtue's tambourines are visually out of sync with the music. There are still some bits and pieces that just kind of miss. Like, Lucifer's big number after the fall sounds like it sits in a really weird place in Zadunich's range, too low to let him really wail, and too high for his signature deep bass purring. When you sing, um, and when you hit those low notes, what is the feeling you get? I think someone's been sitting on the speakers when I hit those low notes. <laughs> I'm sure it's nothing. And it just kind of sounds harsh and unpleasant to me. And show a little class. But it's entirely possible I'm misdiagnosing the problem or that tone was on purpose and just doesn't work for me. Painted Doll once again gets the number that drives home the Aesop connection, this time called Hoof and Lap, and Emily Autumn is once again a goddamn feast for the ears, but for some reason the chorus of the song is just in German. My labor, my bread. I genuinely have no idea what the logic is other than like, cabaret is also a musical. And a few lines of that are in German, but this isn't like bye bye mein lieber Herr, it's a quatrain and a half of pretty fast moving, dense words communicating totally new and unique information. And there aren't any burned in captions or anything, even if you watch the movie with subtitles it just gives you the German. In the later repetitions the bayonets echo in English, but the way the song is mixed there is no chance you're going to catch it all from them. I only even noticed when I looked up the lyrics online. It's a real shame too, because once you run it through Google Translate, this is absolutely the crux of the take on Aesop. Like in the verses, Painted Doll is telling the story, but then the chorus is a call for her fellow fillies to take up arms against the corrupt system. It would really tie the whole thing together if there were any reason to expect that the audience at large could understand what was happening. But the much more interesting and consistent problem that is also the greatest improvement shows up in the watchword and the agent's songs 
the watchword's hour, and midnight rectory. In both cases, the verses are dense with poetry and just like a lot of words in a way that both Barry Bostwick and Adam Pascal are clearly struggling to spit out in time. This is already not the worst thing, since once again they're not communicating a ton of plot information. Like, The Watchword's Hour is a sneaky paparazzo's I Am song, and it sounds sneaky, and he's got a camera. And Midnight Rectory is basically just a song about, hey, we're having a Prohibition era party, over a scene of, look, they're having a Prohibition era party. So it's not like we lose a whole lot by missing the finer details, but it is less fun to listen to than it could be, and I feel reasonably confident saying that if Broadway veteran Adam Pascal is struggling to fit all your lyrics into the rhythm they're written in, the problem is most likely not Broadway veteran Adam Pascal. And you know, Barry Bostwick too, he's got a Tony, that shit's probably not his fault either. But they both end their choruses on punchy little stingers that nail the delivery of the TLDR. The hour belongs to the watchword. That is a catchy ass way to say watch your back or you'll end up on page six. This is what I mean about emphasis on the right syllable. Even if you don't quite pick up on all the details fleshed out by the rest of the song, you walk away humming the most important piece of information. And I mean this from a listenability perspective too. Like, Midnight Rectory is more of a flavor text moment, it doesn't really matter whether or not you pick up any information from the lyrics, but even from a pure listenability perspective, the verses are messy in a way that's distracting, but it finds its groove in the chorus. <laughs> And it builds up to a really solid little hook. The song is structured so that the part that sticks with you is the good part. Although then the second chorus is different and it's way weaker. Okay. But the wildest number in this whole damn movie is called Good Little Dictation Machines. Wild because it's good. This is a fucking song that belongs in a musical. It was stuck in my head for like two days after I watched the movie once. Boom, baby! And it's exactly the same pattern. There are a lot of words here. And while the actors, Chantel Claret of Morningwood and Jimmy Urin of Mindless Self-Indulgence, for crying out loud, how did they afford this cast, very much nail it in this case, they are singing in deliberately thick accents that make it tough to catch the whole gist of what they're saying. Listen back to your domestication. I'm hearing! But when you hit the button on the chorus, there's this really nice little build up and pop. <laughs> it lands hard on talk, which is more or less the whole point here distilled into one word. This is a hostile interrogation. That's what these characters do, and that's what the song is about. So even if you do struggle to understand every word here, you walk away with the main idea abundantly clearly. Frankly, it's to your advantage if you don't follow the song word for word, because for utterly inscrutable reasons, the actual, literal text of the lyrics of this song are about the technological advancements that have brought us the dictaphone. For fuck's sake, Terrence, are you doing this to me on purpose? There's a through line in this panel from Sinister Creature Con featuring Zadunich alongside Nell Campbell and Barry Bostwick, which for the record is genuinely hilarious and probably the only thing I'm going to talk about today that gets my wholehearted recommendation to watch in its entirety if you're at all interested. Zadunich is like a little starstruck because his whole thing has sort of been wanting to create the next Rocky horror. I feel really, uh underqualified <laughs> And Campbell and Bostwick just immediately drop into the exact right personas to rib the shit out of him, with Campbell as this like unbelievably powerful MILF who is sort of condescendingly fascinated with this unknown boy toy who's been placed in her path. I don't want to overlook Terrence, he's very handsome. And Bostwick as the clueless third wheel. Maybe if we sat down at a bar later. Yeah. <laughs> Over a couple hey. of drinks. Something very natural and unexpected would come out of a conversation. You have to tell me your room number. I like drinks too. I like drinks. <laughs> it's great. One of the things that my that interests me the most is trying to find new ways. To women. Sorry. Occasionally drifts into territory that makes me feel some sort of way. We had to change all the keys and. Um, 
I sort of like this script. She thinks I'm coming in through the door. But I'm sure it's nothing, right? Contained within this sort of doofy persona Bostwick is inhabiting is a guy who is bitter that he wasn't cast in that one movie that one time. Because as it turns out, he is connected to Zadunich not only through his role in Alleluia, but through having auditioned for the title-ass role in Repo. I did one of his movies. Oh, really? Both of them? Repo? Repo? Oh no, it wasn't Repo. That's the one they auditioned for. And you didn't cast me in it, you... <laughs> Bostwick is an incredibly good sport who's totally willing to make himself the butt of the joke in bringing this up. I'm a bitter man. Can you tell me? <laughs> Because I wasn't cast in his first movie. Oh. <laughs> so therefore I never saw it. Which allows him to unironically hit directly on my whole frustration here. Anything you can't do, Terrence. <laughs> Write a hit song. Oh. Oh. Did I say that? Oh. Fuck me! Did you ever listen to the monkeys? <laughs> Just look and listen to this, some of their songs. I think you can write them through the band. You got it in you, man. I know you do. This is exactly why Zadunich's work is so compelling and also why it is so frustrating. It feels like you fed an AI the complete works of Andrew Lloyd Webber, Stephen Sondheim, Rob Zombie, Stephen King, Tim Burton, My Chemical Romance, and Nine Inch Nails and asked it to write you a musical. It understands the framework of how to write a fun goth trash story you can get invested in through songs you can sing along to, and goddammit, it does get close, but it's missing the actual human heart that would assemble all of the theoretically interesting bits and pieces of ideas into something that makes sense, something fun. So my newest project with, with, that I'm writing, co-writing with Sar Hindleman, who co-wrote all the Devil's Carnival music. Um, America is the character. So that challenge is exciting to me. Now where it's all going to end up, I don't know. Can right. you dance to it? That's what I want to know. <laughs> is there a danceable talk song in it? Bizarrely, the Donner Party aspect, which is coming out, yep. there's a sock hop in it. And for once, Zadunich is telling the truth. American Murder Song is a musical act consisting of Terence Zadunich and his Devil's Carnival co-composer Sar Handelman as balladeers Mr. Tender and Mr. Storm, respectively, focused primarily on original murder ballads. Since founding the act in 2016, the pair have released four EPs and three full albums, recorded a number of music videos and companion shorts, created a board game, and performed a number of high-concept live touring and online shows, including a fictional wake, a live taping of a non-existent television show, a fan submission cover contest, several series of living room shows, and a Fear Factor style feast of Donner Party inspired foods. And to be entirely frank, it is a revelation. Some of this is definitely personal, like while the whole macabre rock opera and hell circus musical vibe very much appeals to what remains of my 15 year old self who worshipped the Who's Tommy and plastered pictures of Brendan Urie in a top hat all over every empty surface, this project feels fucking tailor-made to the weirdo I am now whose top Spotify artists include Rob Zombie and the Avit Brothers listed right next to each other for all of Tinder to see. But this is also just better music. Every track objectively slaps. Zadunich and Handelman, it turns out, are impeccably well suited to music that contains a story, but upon which a story does not depend. The major problem of Repo and The Devil's Carnival, where you kind of have to go at the music with a shovel and a brush to have any hope of following the movie's plot, is actually built right into the conceit of the American murder ballad, where a lot of the intrigue is in joyously clap stomping along with Tom Dooley and then looking back at the words you just saying like, wait, I'll be where hanging from what? And a lot of the more experimental musical impulses that are uh, difficult to distinguish from incompetence in The Devil's Carnival appear here with some much needed restraint that allows them to absolutely shine. The five bar phrases in Black Matilda set the funeral dirge just a hair off kilter. Oh, a black Tilda, by the lamb are we saved. 
The shifting rhythmic emphasis in Murder, Murder creates this great contrast that perfectly rides the line between the panicked shouting of a crowd and the complete control of a balladeer. Murder be thy name, out, out, murder be thy name. The extra beat in the last line of the chorus of Pretty Lavinia gives the voices we're hearing a neat little character flourish. Pretty, pretty, pretty Lavinia. And the storytelling sensibility of Body on the Step is every bit as mysterious, compelling, and creepy as Repo and both Devil's Carnival movies desperately wanted to be, spun out over this absolutely dank driving backbeat. With a rope in her apron and black fork and I, a body on the step and lies all about. I want this song playing in my life just always. And hey, it turns out cool music videos that are just cool are even cooler when you don't have to feel all frustrated that they're confusing in the context of an already confusing movie. Plus, 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 since there's no overarching plot justifying the existence of a bunch of barely clad ladies or trying to make some statement on the inherent shallowness of womankind, I can just enjoy these songs without getting smacked in the face with my own self-loathing. Maybe there's some gross shit in there, I don't know, because I don't need to know. I mean, there's this fucking merch store that looks a whole lot like it came straight out of Terence Zadunich's wet dream about the hot young groupie who snuck into his hotel room, but I'm sure it's nothing, right? And you know, coming off this goodwill, Google keeps wanting me to ask who this dude is married to for some reason. I mean, I might as well. How badly could that? Oh. Oh. Oh, no, 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 no. Between January 2018 and May 2019, a Tumblr blog called Fall for Fables, a reference to a lyric from Alleluia, published a series of posts processing the emotional and social aftermath of an alleged four-year relationship with Terence Zadunich, allegedly marked by constant controlling and gaslighting behavior, including refusal to acknowledge the relationship publicly, frequent cheating, flirting with fans in front of her, giving her an STD, joking about roofing her as an opening line, laughing off her sexuality as something he'd straighten out, and wrangling a proxy invite to a party she did not want him to come to after they had broken up just to make a scene. In addition, the blog's author chronicles hearing Zadunich make frequent homophobic and transphobic comments, including a slew pointedly and deliberately aimed at an ex with whom she was still close friends, simultaneously mock and thirst over fat fans, and make comments about rape only barely passable as jokes with such frequency that it was allegedly an absolute known quantity to everyone who interacted with him, fan, friend, and collaborator alike. And just as a final nail in the coffin of separating art from the artist, she points to a character in Alleluia who is named after her by her account knowingly and intentionally on Zadunish his part, who is eternally damned, yes, literally for reading a book she wasn't supposed to read, but in the Hayes Code and Aesop sense, very much for having an ambiguously romantic history with a woman and tempting a powerful man into a secret relationship, and who upon her arrival in hell is promptly subjected to physical and, between the lines, ongoing mental and emotional abuse by Zadunich as Lucifer. The blog also features asks and reblogs from a number of other Tumblr users who describe varying degrees of allegedly disturbing interactions with Zadunich, including non-consensual touching during photo ops, dates where boundaries were pressured if not steamrolled right over, and continual text and online messages following bad dates reiterating that he did nothing wrong, and these girls should be grateful that such a talented artist wanted to be sexual with them. The overall picture painted by the blog is that of a man who is acutely aware of his popularity with young female fans and has no qualms about using that dynamic to his sexual advantage. I believe these stories, first and foremost because I think it requires a lot more mental gymnastics and is much more indicative of an agenda to try to ignore or discredit them, especially in light of the themes of Zadunich's work, some of the most disturbing of which I haven't even talked about here, and many 
many of the things he has said publicly. So... At one point, I even leaned in to kiss her. Um, and she turned away. Now, what do you do when they turn away? <laughs> they turn them right the fuck back. <laughs> I'm sorry, your, your outfit is very distracting. <laughs> Also because I am reasonably confident that I know who the blog's author is. I'm not going to name her, in part because the blog also chronicles frequent abusive messages from Zadunich's fans, including successfully inciting Zadunich himself to renewedly stalk her, and I absolutely do not want any part in bringing more of that about and in part because she is clear in her writing that while she welcomes her posts to be shared as readers see fit, she does not have any intentions to talk about the events in a more public or official way directly connected to herself, the person, and I want to respect those wishes. I recognize that it is easy for a person to lie about their identity on the internet, and on Tumblr specifically. And I recognize that I am potentially stretching my and this person's credibility by not listing my evidence. I am not a journalist. I have not reached out to anyone for comment. The standards to which I hold myself are mine to determine. And I am making the call that I am much more concerned about the ethics of bringing unwished for thunder upon a person who has allegedly already been through way too much than I am about bringing an unpleasant drop to the bucket of a public figure with an incredibly dedicated fan base who, not for nothing, has built his image largely on being edgy and controversial. I mean, to be clear, please don't go harassing him or his fans in my or anyone's name. Nobody needs that. For whatever it's worth, what I see in this blog is much more indicative of a real human dropping accidental crumbs of and not actively hiding her identity than it is of a person lying about who they are for clout. The blog rarely drops her full name, and the times when it does are only in later posts when she is expressing her conflicted feelings about speaking up in a more public way. She refers to her middle name, with which the person she appears to be is not professionally associated, simply as her name. The person I think she is has had small roles in multiple projects I've cited here, as well as ones that I haven't, but would be a relatively random dart thrown at the IMDb page for anyone who wasn't coming in with the context I had, which was a video with a number of views on YouTube that would be relatively paltry even by the standards of my channel. To, again, protect her privacy, I'm not going to show it, you're going to have to trust my account, but I have made an artist's rendering. So it's a red card event, and there's this interviewer asking fun surface-level questions to a bunch of the actors and creative team members and stuff, and most of them are there alone, but then Terence Zadunich is standing with this young woman who looks a good bit younger than him. Like, not so much younger that it's ringing all the alarm bells, she looks like an adult, and you probably wouldn't confuse her for his daughter, but there'd be no doubt in your mind which direction the age gap went. And she's in the shot, but just over at the edge, and she's rocking this body language that is so, so immediately recognizable as the partner who is along and being supportive at that thing that is basically their partner's deal. And most of the footage of the two of them that made it into this video is of Zadunich talking and her listening. But then the interviewer asks about favorite songs in the movie, and this young woman answers, and she gestures at Zadunich and says that she's biased, so she has to say the song that he sings, but also she really likes this one other piece, and she says a little bit about it. And then later the interviewer asks for their favorite movie musicals, and Zadunich says Rocky Horror, and this young woman says Repo the genetic opera, like it's the single most obvious answer to any question in the world. So, 
there is, you know, there is a set of axes where at one corner you have a committed member of a loving and equal romantic relationship talking up their partner's work because they think that their partner is great and they think that their partner's work is great and publicly complimenting them is both true to their feelings and part of their shared love language. And then at the opposite corner, you have an artist using their platform to gain sexual access to a fan. The exact location of the line past which things become exploitative is an incredibly complex question, and where exactly a given relationship falls is generally not something that can be surmised from the outside using a sum total of, like, 60 seconds of interview footage. But something in this clip just rang a bell for me. Like, I'd seen this couple before. And that was, I think, the moment that Terence Zadunich became the car wreck I could not look away from. I started obsessively googling the guy, I think out of twin hopes that I'd find evidence that the sweet and welcoming boyfriend image I saw in that interview required no further interrogation, and all the questionable themes of his projects were the result of kind of ignorantly repeating patterns from other works without interrogation in a poorly aged attempt at edginess, and he was mostly a good and respectful dude whose work I could continue having extremely Benoit Blanc feelings about in peace, or that I would find irrefutable evidence that he was at least as much of a creep as I was starting to think he might be, and it would be such an immediate lady boner killer that I could move on with my life and never give him another thought. And honestly, if you'd asked me a week before I started writing this script, I would have assumed that any one of the dozens of clips that I found would have been enough to yeet him clean into the sun in my eyes. The man cannot get in front of a microphone without announcing that he is a menace. But when I stumbled backwards into Fall for Fables, which, to be abundantly clear, was exactly what I was expecting to find, right down to the identity of the whistleblower. It still cracked me the fuck open. And I still couldn't look away. Even now, at the actual final bottom of this goddamn rabbit hole, I still, deep in my heart of hearts, have a tiny sliver of myself that, like, Okay, so Darren Sedunich appears to live in the same basic part of the country as I do. American Murder Song seems to frequently roll with these really intimate and accessible little living room shows during non-pandemic times. And this dude clearly has an interest in his pretty lady fans. Terry, sweetie, I know you usually go for little glass vials, but I think you're really gonna like this big wood cask of Amontillado. I watched Repo the Genetic Opera for the first time on Tuesday, February 2nd at around 10 a.m. I first drafted this sentence on Wednesday, February 10th at 8.06 p.m. I went through this whole journey from having no association with the name Zadunich at all, to watching one movie that made no damn sense compelled me, though, to tracking down the dude's whole body of work, to discovering something he'd done that I absolutely loved, to finding out that he's allegedly a sex pest dipshit in literally eight days, and going through that whole process that should usually take years in just over a week? has given me shocking insight into the way that it works. The question of what do we do with great art by terrible people, or, you know, stuff that we like made by terrible people, is an incredibly complex one, and it's certainly not one I'm going to give a satisfactory blanket solution today. It's so tempting to tell you that if you're in mourning for your goth opera and your horror carnival that must needs be dead to you now, you should just listen to Emily Autumn. And I can't explain it, but probably clipping? Or that I am your grave robber now. I mean, you should, and I am. But replacing your problematic faves with untouchably holy and unproblematic new ones is a band-aid solution that keeps us all set up for disappointment that will continue spiraling more and more toward feeling like personal betrayal. For the love of all that is holy, please do not do that to your parasocial relationship with me. I'm not planning on going anywhere, and in all likelihood, I will disappoint you at some point. I'm not trying to both sides it here. Terence Zadunich allegedly seems like a pretty awful person on a level light years beyond a handful of underbaked tweets whose bad behavior is directly enabled by having a platform. And I'm 
absolutely planning to minimize my contribution to that platform as much as possible going forward. Please don't think I haven't sweated long and hard about whether to even make this video at all. What I'm trying to get at is this is never an isolated issue. I mean, it's clear that ousting Terence Zadunich, whomst is a bad, would not have been enough to fix the culture of even his own damn sets. And I remember I was in the makeup trailer getting into Lucifer makeup, and Darren came in, uh, kind of giggling like a schoolboy, and he goes, um, Clown is whipping Brianna, and she just got naked. <laughs> and I was like, I told, I told the makeup people oh, oh. <laughs> mid-brush, I'm like, I'll be right back. And I just ran out, and I remember we were sitting... <laughs> watching well i met how i met emily which was crazy is um i was on on the web and, and she had a banner ad it was from one of her tours and i was like damn this girl's hot how i got alexa vega and repo was i started facebooking her obsessively until she finally contacted me and said stop emily was a little worse than that because at this point there's now twitter there's facebook and her message board and I started just like like I was obsessed. Every five minutes, I'd send a new email. And finally, her tour manager said, seriously, you're creeping us out. Go away. And I was like, but I'm a director. Be in my movie. I think I'm a track. I absolutely have a crush on uh, Lyndon Smith as well. I'm just going to throw that out there right now. I had the biggest crush on Alexa because she's Alexa Vega. I'm going to show you one of my favorite things to make Alexa do in front of the entire crew yeah. while we were doing lighting changes. Like, you guys saw the wardrobe I wear. Like, little short skirts. So I'm wearing, like, these little bloomers underneath. And the dirty director is sitting in his chair. He's like, do the dance. You know, as my skirt looks really stiff up and down, what we do to get work. Terry, baby. Why don't you bring your friend Darren around too? I know he appreciates a good Italian vintage. So, you know, I think a lot of us are dealing with this feeling of exhaustion around reckoning with ethical consumption every time we turn on the TV. It is, of course, crucial that we keep the blame where it belongs on the entertainment industry, on capitalism, on white supremacy and patriarchy, on the systems that have allowed and even encouraged behavior like this to thrive, have created the mythos that it is in and of itself artistic, and of course on the people who take advantage of these systems to behave like goddamn dipshits. The problem is not me too. The problem is not the many people of color who have finally been listened to in the aftermath of the George Floyd protests and beyond. The problem is the decades and decades of cover-ups and open secrets in boys clubs that have created such a massive backlog for the admin desks of our brains to process all at once, and the slow-moving industries that continue to hire and reward these people, and the people who continue to be goddamn dipshits, because even if it's more talked about, it's still come back from a bull. Darren Lynn Bowsman directed Spiral, released earlier this year. And apparently, the line in the sand that my brain's overworked and underpaid front desk administrator has drawn is something like, Take from me the biting satire that built my sense of humor, my space westerns and my superheroes. Take from me the foundations of my favorite writing playlists and the music that defined my teenage years. Yay, take from me all that I love and deem good. But but you will never have my weird cult classic internet rabbit holes that I don't really know if I even like. Leave me that much. Leave me my dignity. And I don't know, that makes so little logical goddamn sense that I don't know if I can really judge where anyone else is drawing that line. This is hard, and we are none of us navigating it without nonsense baggage. But there is also something a little deeper here. I have personal experience working with someone who turned out to be the worst. I used to be part of a relatively small town community and semi-pro theater scene, and there was a director who worked a lot who, uh, well, it was sort of a known fact that he was a creep. Nothing major, nothing tangible, but the level where uh, I auditioned for the one show I did with him more or less because there was a sense among the actresses in town that he made casting decisions based on who he found attractive. And I'd gotten enough of that vibe off of him in our brief interactions that it seemed like the best shot I'd ever have at a bit of a left field against type dream role of mine. During rehearsals, he repeatedly remarked on the size of my body, but always in situations where it was technically relevant, like blocking a scene where another actor had to pick me up. 
he invited this critic to one of our tech runs, a blogger who had lost basically all credibility in the community when he published a review referring to an underage actress costumed in a crop top as eye candy. That actress was in our cast and still underage. There was another actress in the cast who I eventually realized was both a student from one of the university classes this director taught as an adjunct and his live-in girlfriend. They were so open about it that I guess I just sort of assumed it must have technically been fine. You know, she wasn't a minor, she was all the way in her 20s, so even if it definitely set off some sort of bells for me, I didn't quite have the vocabulary yet to figure out what about it felt so wrong, or if there was anything I could or should do about it. What I did do was I spent a lot of 2017 and 2018 commenting back on this director's Facebook posts about how Jeffrey Tambor did nothing wrong, and James Levine was a victim of a guilty until proven innocent witch hunt. I had moved to a new city by that point and had no intention of coming back, and it felt like a small service I could provide to people who might still have to worry about the professional consequences of his opinion of them to call that shit out in whatever small way I could, and usually ratio the fuck out of him. A few months after the last time I did that, his level of creep got him arrested. While I wasn't an active part of the community anymore, the general vibe based on social media and conversations I had with old friends and colleagues was that while the news was harrowing, absolutely no one was surprised. I bring all of this up because the way I felt working with this director was the same way I felt when I started googling Terence Zadunich. One part, this dude is creepy as hell and you know it. Three parts, but he seems nice though. My guard's probably just a little bit up. I'm sure I'm just misinterpreting things. Innocent until proven guilty. What? Bullshit, right? Like, I do think this is rooted in a worthwhile impulse somewhere deep down, obviously. Humans, we make snap judgments, and we are often wrong, and it's good to check ourselves, especially when you're talking about people you actually know on a human level. People in your professional community on whose lives and careers you might have some impact. People you could sidle up to at post-rehearsal drinks and be like, hey, so what was the deal with that blogger in the audience? tonight. I thought we weren't inviting him to stuff anymore, and see how they respond. I'd suggest that we could, you know, continue working a little harder to make sure we're collectively drawing the line where we stop hiring folks somewhere before they get arrested for sexual battery of a minor. But uh, sure, I respect that there is an amount of caution with which it makes sense to proceed, even if it's almost certainly a good bit less than what the norm has been since time immemorial. But for a public figure, an artist I will in all likelihood never even meet in passing, fucking why? I can make a snap judgment based on one line of dialogue in one plot line in one of his movies, based on one sentence he said one time in one Q&A, based on one pair of fucking booty shorts in his creepy ass merch store, and literally nothing will happen to either of us. The likelihood that even my making this video will have any effect whatsoever on Terence Zadunich's life, on his platform, on his ability to make art or the strength of his fan base is like minuscule. There is not even the tiniest, slightest whiff of an ethical dilemma about deciding that he seems like a creep and I don't want to engage with him or his work based on not quite enough evidence. So why did it take so much? Certainly some of it is the art itself. I mean, past a certain word count, you just gotta stop pretending that the distinction of like or don't like is a meaningful one and admit the thing did a number on you. And you know, even beyond that, like some of this little intimate performance arty stuff, staging a concert with a fourth wall breaking narrative where the audience are attendees at a wake, I didn't talk about the tutor in this video, partly because in content it kind of blows way past, oh, well, I could be misinterpreting right into, oh no, this dude's creepy as fuck. 
but as a format, it's a series of painting tutorials that slowly reveal themselves to be part of a horror story that culminated in a live event where the audience, like, actually painted pictures and got awards. That's dope. It's the kind of stuff I wanted to make when I was a high school theater dork just learning about Brecht and Bawal. It makes me miss acting school in the best way. And it's not that often that you accidentally stumble upon people who just happen to be doing cool shit like that in the city where you live. And it continues to be no fun to be like, well, guess I'm never going to that. I don't want to downplay that because I think there can be a somewhat disingenuous impulse to act like the art was always worthless when the cultural pendulum swings toward acknowledging that an artist is a shithead. J.D. Salinger, when he was alive, used his reputation as a literary genius and a notorious recluse to emotionally abuse at least one 18-year-old girl. He also wrote one of my favorite books ever published. Those things, unfortunately, do not stop one another from being true. Be a lot easier if they did, but they don't. Terence Zadunich is not J.D. Salinger. To me. But he sure seems to be for some people, and the lack of established canonization doesn't take away from the fact that his work has meant stuff to people, and that will make it a hell of a lot harder to deal with him allegedly being a shitty person. Some of the most heart-wrenching parts of Fall for Fables blog, to me, are when she actively wrestles with her deep connection to Repo, and to the character of Shiloh in particular. I may not get it, but it's real, and if you're a person watching right now and having that sort of reaction, I feel you, dude. Shit's hard. But I also think whether the art is good or compelling or something that you like or not, there can still be this deep, deep drive to be wrong in your assessment of someone as a shitbag. I never really cared for the work of that director I knew back in my community theater scene. Even the show I did with him was one of the rare ones I actively didn't invite my friends to come see. But that didn't stop me from trying to convince myself that everything must be fine, actually. I disliked The Devil's Carnival, and it was pretty clear to me that the Tamara storyline was indicative of a shitty person being shitty. And if anything, that somehow made me more determined to seek out Zadunich's work and public persona in the hopes that it would prove me wrong. I think, maybe, that it just sucks to share the planet with a shithead, and most of us would actually prefer to be proved wrong. But at some point, when a person tells you who they are, over and over again, you gotta start believing them. Zydrig comes in a little glass vial, a little glass vial, a little glass vial, and a little glass vial goes into the gun like a battery. And the Zydrig gun goes somewhere against your anatomy. And when the gun goes off, it sparks and you're ready for surgery, 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 surgery. And Amber Sweet is addicted to the knife, addicted to the knife, addicted to the knife, and addicted to the knife, she needs a little help with the agony. And a little help comes in a little glass vial and a gun pressed against her anatomy. And when the gun goes off, Miss Sweet is ready for surgery. 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 Max Contracts got some mighty fine prints, some mighty fine prints, some mighty fine, and that mighty fine prints puts Mag in a mighty fine predicament. Do 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 to see if Mag up and splits her eyes are forfeit, and if Jean Co and Roddy so will it, then a repo man will come and she'll pay for that surgery, 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 surgery. See, it's funny because I really like this song, and I can't listen to it anymore without doing this. It's the worst thing Terrence Zadunich has ever done. Oh hi! I didn't see you there. Thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. 
If you made it this far, you might want to consider supporting me over at patreon.com slash laracrone. It's thanks to my patrons that I'm able to do big, weird, ambitious projects like this, so I'd like to say an extra special thank you to Andreas Evans, Exceedingly Lizzie, Ilona Kinsetta, Joe Schlesinger, Michelle, Mimi McGann, Richard Lawson, and Ronnie Rocket as well as to Blaze Utz, Cold Crash Pictures, and Ellie HP, because I messed up and forgot to thank them in the last video.